Securing Citrix communication. You know, security is all the news these days. Security's all over the place. We're doing patch management. We're locking down ports on firewalls. We're, we're doing everything we can to secure our internal networks from attack. And Citrix is really no different from any of, the, any of the other technologies in your environment. Security is very important. And arguably, you could say that with the Citrix, it's actually more important because in a lot of cases, your Citrix infrastructures are fronted to the internet. If, you're, if your Citrix infrastructure has internet access so people on the outside Side world can connect into your Citrix infrastructure, you're probably going to want to make sure that that's secured appropriately. In this nugget, we're going to talk about the different types of secure architectures. We're, we're going to talk about ICA encryption and the, the SSL relay and the web interface and using secure gateway. These are the three types we're going to talk about for this particular nugget. We're also going to talk about how you can do address translations from your Citrix servers to the outside world and how you can do NAT and PAT firewall translations, getting that data from the inside secure network out to your external insecure network. So let's talk about each of these three architectures for security. I'm going to bring up a, a graphic here that shows my workstation and a, a web server. This is the web interface server, and then also a Citrix box. Now, why is security really important? If I'm at my workstation here and I'm attempting to connect into this web server, if I draw an arrow here, that's supposed to represent the connection between this workstation and the web interface server. In this case, my workstation connects to the web interface server to get the web page where the applications are enumerated, where, where all of my access is presented to my user. Now, we talked about this in the previous nugget, but one thing that we didn't notice or that we didn't discuss in the previous nugget is that once the user clicks an application that they want to log into in web interface, the connection to the Citrix server is directly connected to that Citrix server. Now, you'll, this is probably not a big problem if you're in a local area network where you've got, uh, you know, your workstations are in one area and your, your servers in another area and there's a local area network and it's all a secure area between them. This is probably not a big deal, but if I'm going across the internet, the connection here to this web server probably should be different than the connection to the Citrix server. I don't want to open up a direct connection to my Citrix server. And that's the reason that we need to do these additional types of secure Citrix communication. For our first example, let's talk about ICA encryption. Let's say that you, your entire environment is lo located inside of a local area network, and your C Citrix server is uh, in a secure area, and your workstation's in a pretty secure area, but you still have some concerns about this traffic moving in clear text across the network. You, you want to put together a best effort attempt to encrypt the traffic between the Citrix server and the workstation. In that case, you would enable ICA encryption, R-Y-P-T-I-O-N. When you enable ICA encryption, it's actually the easiest of all of these types of security methods to enable. When you enable ICA encryption, what it does is the Citrix traffic that comes over TCP 1494 from the Citrix server to the workstation is encrypted using an RC5 encryption mechanism. This is, again, sort of a best effort mechanism to ensure that at least you're not passing data across the network that's in clear text. Now remember, Citrix traffic is really nothing more than screen scrapes and mouse and keyboard updates. So even if the user was able to decrypt this traffic, they're still only going to get the changes that are going on. It's, it's very difficult to get data out of this, this traffic. But if you have a need for encryption, you can use this IC encryption to do that. Let's show where that's enabled now. If we look at our CMC again, this is the, the Nugget Farm CMC we've looked at throughout all the nuggets here, and we have the Applications node enabled. You'll see the Applications node, we can choose any particular application, choose Properties, and once we go into the Properties, we can view the Client Options screen. And the Client Options screen down here, you'll see this Encryption tab. This is the option where we can choose Basic or 128-bit logon only. This will only encrypt the logon component, 40-bit, uh, 56-bit, or 120 bit Depending what our requirements are for encrypting the traffic between the Citrix server and the workstation, we can choose one of these. Note that depending on how strong you want this encryption to, to be, really, and this is this is just me, but really, I, you don't see a lot of performance hit based on increasing encryption requirements like you do with some tools. So really, you're, you're pretty safe to keep your encryption at a high level. You can also check this box for minimum requirement. If you want to require a particular level of encryption, you can set that here. So ICA encryption, again, is sort of a, a best effort just to, just to keep the honest people honest. You, you typically do this when you want to secure internal communication within a LAN or a WAN that, that has limited access to the internet, or you want to secure communications from devices that you're using DOS or Win 16 systems, you know, older systems that don't have these newer technologies for upgrading, and you have no risk of man-in-the-middle attacks. 
Again, ICA encryption, very basic, very minimum. The next tool we can use is called SSL Relay. SSL Relay is intended when we have a small number of systems, just a, a, like few, five or fewer systems that we want to encrypt traffic between. What it does is we create a, we add a root certificate onto this workstation. And a root certificate can be anything like uh, a VeriSign or, or one of the, the large certificate stores out there that, that, that Internet Explorer will typically trust already. Or you can add a root server for, um, uh, manually through your, your internal infrastructure. But we add a root server certificate onto our clients, and we add a server certificate here onto our web interface server and or our Citrix servers. And what that does is that encapsulates the ICE stream into SSL traffic, which is a stronger mechanism for encrypting this traffic. In addition to being able to encrypt SSL traffic, because it is a certificate based, also authenticates, which means that we can guarantee that the server traffic is coming from the correct server. So SSL Relay is a tool for, again, for very small installations where you want to encrypt traffic between either a web server and a client, a Citrix server and a client, or even a web server and a Citrix server. Remember that when we connect to our web interface server to enumerate our applications, that web interface server has to talk to the Citrix server using the XML service to enumerate the applications to bring back to the user. That communication between the web server and the Citrix server is not encrypted. It's actually in clear text. And the passwords that are used to enable this information are, although not sent across in clear text, they're using an obfuscation method to send that password information from the web servers to the Citrix server. That obfuscation method may be potentially easily hackable. So in cases where we're concerned about this communication between the web server and the Citrix server, we may want to enable SSL relay between these two servers. Or again, in a small instance, we may want to enable SSL relay between the workstation and the Citrix server. So we talked about this SSL relay requirement of having a certificate on the server, a root certificate here in this workstation, and the server certificate here. But one of the requirements for the CCA exam is knowing actually how to request and, and install these certificates. I've created a Windows certificate server onto CTX Nugget 2 here. And if I go to the slash cert SRV location, we can actually create a certificate request by clicking this request or certificate logo. The type of certificate we're looking for is actually a server certificate. So we're going to create an advanced certificate request and submit this request to this CA. If you're using a, a, a VeriSign or another organization to create uh, a request through them, they may have some other mechanism to create the request. But if we're using our own certificate services infrastructure, we can do it using this methodology. I'm going to pause while I enter in all the information here. And poof, it's entered. Don't you wish it was that easy to enter, enter in information? So we've entered in this information. We've requested a server authentication certificate. And we've left pretty much everything else the same. And so we click Submit. This is going to request the new certificate on our behalf, and we're going to click yes to go ahead and generate the request. Once we go back into the certificate services and approve the certificate, we can come back and install the certificate on this local machine. If I flip over to my other machine, this is a machine that has certificate services installed on it, you'll see we have the certification authority um, control panel up. And if we go down and look for pending requests, we'll see this request that we've, rec that we've submitted. If we choose to issue the certificate, we can now go back to our original server and, and view the pending request. You'll see if we click the home button here, we can say view the status of a pending certificate request. You'll see that our certificate has been approved and we can install the certificate now. If we click to install the certificate, it says, do you want to install the certificate? Of course we want to install the certificate. So we click yes. You'll notice here that we get a security warning for the certificate that says that this particular certificate is coming from a CA that we don't necessarily trust. This is the difference between a root certificate and a server certificate. This server certificate has to be able to trust up the certification chain to a root certificate. And because we don't have the root certificate for this Microsoft Certificate Services certificate on this machine, we're going to need to include that as well. We're going to go ahead and install this certificate now. To install the root certificate, we need to go back to the home screen again, and we need to download the certificate chain for this particular certificate. If we download the CA certificate chain to our local machine in this P7B format, we can click the Save button and save it to the desktop. The interesting thing about this is that with this will also show us the process by which to install a third-party certificate, which may come with a P7B or a .sur extension or one of the certificate type of extensions. If we double-click this, this will begin the process of installing the certificate to this location. You'll see here that we can view the certificate. We can verify that this is indeed the certificate for this location issued to CTX Nugget 2 by CTX Nugget 2. To install it, we can right-click it and choose Install Certificate. If we click the Next button, we will automatically select the certificate store based on the type of certificate, hit Next, and Finish. Now the import is successful, and we can now verify that the certificate's chain is fully trusted.
Now, I want to stop here and say that the important part to know about all the certificate services stuff is that certificates can be exceptionally complicated. And it's not necessary for the purposes of the exam to know the intricacies of Microsoft Certificate Services. But what you do need to know is that this button right here enables the Citrix SSL relay configuration. Once the certificate is installed and that certificate is available, you can see the certificate here, you can enable the SSL relay for this particular server. Under the connection tab, you'll want to make sure that the server's fully qualified domain name, ctxnugget1.nuggetlab.com, is available so that it knows that any requests coming along port 1494 or port 80 will be encrypted as it goes out. And also the Cypher suites that are available to you. There are two Cypher suites in Citrix Presentation Server. Four, those are gov and com. And it's important to know that both of these are the two types of Cypher suites that are available for Citrix SSL Relay. Once you have these three items configured in this configuration, you can click the Apply button and the OK button, and you'll be warned that you'll need to reboot the server for these changes to be activated. If we switch machines for a second to move over to our Windows XP workstation, you'll see that we have Citrix Program Neighborhood installed or, and launched here on the desktop. The one important thing to know is for the clients, if SSL Relay is enabled, that under this Application Set Manager, anytime that you attempt to connect into your infrastructure, you're going to need to change the network protocol from TCP IP plus HTTP to this SSL TLS plus HTTPS entry. It's very important that the certificate that you apply to the server have the same FQDN, the same fully qualified domain name as that server for this to function. Once this is configured, you'll be able to encrypt your traffic between client and server for SSL Relay. Now, so far we've talked about this idea of encrypting the ICA traffic between the, the Citrix server and the workstation and also this SSL relay that does SSL-based encryption. But this all gets, gets difficult if we actually have firewalls that are separating these, uh, this workstation here from the Citrix server. Again, think from a security perspective. If we have a firewall that separates the internet from our Citrix servers, but we allow the ports to open up directly between our, the rest of the world and our Citrix servers, that's a, that's a problem. That can be a hole at our, in our security mindset. So what if what about the idea of creating a proxy, if you will, between this workstation and the Citrix server? That's really what the function of Secure Gateway does. What Secure Date Gateway does is it provides a mechanism by which you can create multiple layers of security between the internet and your clients out on the internet and your Citrix servers, therefore thereby protecting your Citrix servers from this internet traffic. Now, I've got to apologize because this is kind of a complex graphic, but I'm setting up this graphic in the way I am because there's a couple of different ways that you can set up Secure Gateway. Over here on the left, we have a web server that also includes the Secure Gateway components. If our workstation out here on the internet needs to connect into our Citrix server, he connects through the internet cloud to this web server that also includes the Secure Gateway components. Now, if you remember back in our previous slide, we talked about how the web server enumerates the applications and then the, the, the workstation connects directly into the Citrix server for its communication. When we add Secure Gateway into the mix, by adding Secure Gateway into the mix, the Secure Gateway then proxies the traffic to and from the Citrix server. So the Citrix server talks to the Secure Gateway and then the Secure Gateway talks to the workstation. We are in a way are hiding the internal IP address information for this Citrix server to the workstation. And also all of the traffic that comes from our Citrix infrastructure passes through this secure gateway, so only the secure gateway has to get exposed to the internet. That's a much more secure way of, of configuring your externally accessible Citrix infrastructure because now if somebody manages to hack this secure gateway infrastructure, they still have to make another jump to get to your internal Citrix data. The other option is this right-hand side of the graphic here. And in this right-hand side of the graphic, the web server, the web interface server, is separated from the secure gateway server. And you may want to do this if you want to uh, follow the rules of role isolation, of service isolation, so that your secure gateway handles secure gateway functions and your web server handles web server functions, and then never the two shall meet. You may also want to do this to handle the load, so that your web server handles only the web load and the secure gateway handles the secure gateway load. In this instance, if our workstation, again, needs to contact the internet, the, uh, from there, they will open up a connection to our web interface server where they'll get their applications enumerated. The web interface server will then communicate with the secure gateway server and the secure gateway server will handle the proxying back and forth between to the Citrix server. It's this communication path that ensures the most capable amount of security because the, there's multiple hops that have to go between the workstation and the Citrix server for any component, for any data to go from one to the other. One thing that's important to know for either of these two implementations is that out here in the DMZ, 
for each equipment, piece of equipment that's out here in the DMZ, a certificate has to be installed on that piece of equipment. If we don't have that certificate installed, we can't actually encrypt the traffic. So if we choose the right-hand solution, we're going to have to have two certificates that we either purchase or acquire. Using the left-hand solution, we're only going to have to purchase one certificate. So if that's a big deal for you, be aware that certificates are required for all of these DMZ-hosted resources. A third option, if you're in a particularly highly sensitive environment, is the concept of a double hot DMZ. You'll see here that we have our workstation again that's attempting to connect to Citrix servers via the internet. In our double hot DMZ, we actually have two DMZs. We have a DMZ1 and we have a DMZ2 here. And the reason for that is if we require multiple hops to get from the internet to our internal resources, it just makes it that much harder for the traffic to get from the workstation to the secure gateway, from the secure gateway to the web server, from the web server down to the Citrix server. This is a secure gateway proxy service that also has to be installed inside of this second DMZ. So if this is the communication path that you're wanting and you have a very high sense of security requirements and you also have the firewall equipment to support all of this stuff, then this double hop DMZ deployment may be how you want to configure to protect all of your internal resources down here from the bad nasty internet. In any of these environments, there's a concept of a secure ticketing authority. And a secure ticketing authority is a service that actually is shared with Citrix XML service. And the secure ticketing authority is really the concept of Kerberos ticketings. If we, I'm going to put down here that the STA and the XML service are all together. Those are hosted on a Citrix server somewhere inside the infrastructure. And what the secure ticketing authority does is it generates tickets that, it, that assist with the encryption that happens for this traffic from the workstation down to the client. What you need to know is that this secure ticketing authority is hosted with the XML service on a Citrix server, and you actually get the option to choose which Citrix server you use for your secure ticketing authority. We'll go ahead and talk about this here in a second. But first, let's talk about the secure gateway itself. If we minimize this, I've actually mapped the, uh, the Citrix components CD to the D drive here, excuse me, to the Z drive here. And the Citrix components CD is another CD that's not the presentation server CD that comes with your media packet. You'll see that if we open up the auto run here, the secure gateway installation is located here. We would not necessarily, again, want to install this onto a presentation server. This is installed on a separate server that is specifically in the DMZ. For our purposes, let's go ahead and install the secure gateway to see what the installation looks like. To install Secure Gateway, we click the Install Secure Gateway button and it begins the Windows installation process. Again, this is very similar to the presentation server or really any in server installation product, you know, next, 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 finish, and that sort of stuff. So we click Next, we accept the Citrix licensing agreement, we install the Secure Gateway here. You'll notice that we also talked about the Secure Gateway proxy. The Secure Gateway proxy is used in a double hop environment. This is the proxy that is used to get from the second segment of the double hop environment to the first top of the first hop of that double hop environment. In our case, we're going to install the secure, secure Gateway to its default location. In this box, we can choose the service account that the Secure Gateway runs under. For the most part, you can use the local system account for this, or if you want to create one, you can, but local system will function for this. If we click Next, we get the, uh, the Are You Sure screen, and we click Next again to begin the installation. I'll go ahead and pause while this installation completes. And we're done. And that's all we have to do to actually install Secure Gateway. The thing we have to do next is actually configure Secure Gateway. We get this option to configure how we want to secure it. Do we want to secure it for MSAM, for my MetaFrame Secure Access Manager, or are we just connecting to MetaFrame presentation servers? In our case, we don't actually have any MSAM in this environment. We're only connecting to presentation servers. We click OK. And the next screen says, to how do we want to configure? Do we want to click just the standard configuration or the advanced configuration? We'll just do the standard for this point. And we click Next again, and we say, OK, what certificates are available in our certificate store? This certificate is available to us, so we click Next. And how do we want to monitor our IP addresses? Do we want to monitor all IP addresses and under what port? If we have multiple network interfaces, multiple NIC cards on this machine, then we would list them here. You'll see that we're popping an error message here, and that's because the IP address for this particular server is a DHCP address, which is a really bad idea in the first place. But, but be aware that static IP addresses are preferred. How do we want to handle outbound connections? Do we want to allow outbound traffic restrictions? Do we want to use the secure gateway proxy? Is this a multiple hop DMZ? Or do we want to use an access control list? And do we want to enter details of the servers running the secure ticketing authority? Remember that the secure ticketing authority is a presentation server that's running the XML service. If we choose one of our presentation servers, say ctxnugget2.nuggetlab.com, 
This will give us the full path for that secure ticketing authority. Note this slash script slash ctxsta.dll. This is the default path for that, but you just need to know that this is how we would configure the STA. We can also secure that protocol if we want. If we click OK, you'll see here the FQDN and the unique identifier for this connection. This next box allows us to choose how the clients will connect into this secure gateway environment. If it's an indirect connection, the users will con connect to the secure gateway service first and then from there access web interface. In a direct connection, they will connect to the web interface first and then we'll use the secure gateway to proxy the information back and forth between the presentation server and the client. This is going to be an architectural decision for how you want to set up secure gateway and web interface. How do we want to handle our logging? Warning, error, fatal events, etc. And now we can begin the process of starting the secure gateway. You'll see the secure gateway was started successfully, and now we're complete. Once we've completed this initial configuration of secure gateway, the, the remaining configuration, the remaining management of the secure gateway is actually done from inside the Access Suite console. If you, I kind of squished this over here so we could see as much as possible, but remember when we created that web interface site in a previous nugget where we put in here the, the actual web interface site itself and we skipped over this Manage Secure Client Access tab? It's here that we'll actually edit the secure gateway settings. With the same configurations that we did inside of the installation of Secure Gateway, these, configuration, these Secure Gateway settings can be configured through this tab. You'll see we have the Secure Gateway server itself, the port for, for configuring Secure Gateway. We can also enable session reliability through Secure Gateway. We can enable which secure ticket authorities we want to connect to. You notice we talked that slash script slash CTX STA location here. And also, how do we want to manage those secure ticket authorities? Do we want to use them for load balancing or for failover? All of that is located inside of the Access Suite console. The last thing we have to talk about is this concept of address translation. And you'll see here this little graphic that, that's uh, listed here inside of the, uh, the Access Suite console. You'll see there are a number of different ways that we can handle address translation. We have direct, we have alternate, we have translated. What exactly is address translation? Let's minimize this and let's go back to our little picture again so we can take a look at the different options for address translation. Inside of a multiple tiered uh, firewall environment, inside of these DMZ environments, oftentimes the firewalls will change the addresses or NAT translate the addresses as it goes from outside to inside. Net network address translation or NAT translation is the process where an external address, maybe um, 64.127.1.2 or whatever address that is given to you from the internet, author internet authority is translated to an internal address, maybe a 196.128 net address on the inside to protect these addresses. These are the non-routable addresses. In those cases, we want to configure address translation on the part of our Citrix infrastructure so that the external world knows what the internal, or excuse me, so the external world knows only what the external addresses are, but our internal infrastructure knows how to route properly. This address translation stuff is actually pretty complicated, and really how you set up your address translation will be based on how your network configuration is for those DMZs. For direct translation, there's actually no translation that's done whenever you have a direct connection. This is to say that the workstation knows the actual address of the Metaframe farm. In an alternate address, a NAT firewall uses this alternate address to go from the Metaframe farm to the client. In the case of an alternate address, you actually have to use an, a special command on the part of the presentation server called alt addr or alt adder and I'll just show you here alt addr to reconfigure the address that the server is pushing to the outside world you'll notice that we could alt adder slash server server name and then we set the alternate address here we can also set alternate addresses for particular adapters on those servers using this command this is the alt adder command in translated address we create translations using a translation map for these types of translated addresses. If I click here and go to edit address translations, you'll see that for a particular client, this, this type of internal address, this 192.168 non-routable internal address over 1494 is translated to my internet accessible translated address, the external address here. This is considered addre or translated address translation. In the secure gateway environment, we have the same options. We have both direct alternate and translated environments, but you'll see here these are done whenever we have a, an additional secure gateway server that separates the Citrix farm from the clients. Where you actually set up this address translation is back here under Manage Secure Client Access. You'll see Edit DMZ Settings. And you'll see that by default, we are saying clients will directly access the server with its actual IP address. But what if we have a series of clients that we need to translate the address for? Maybe they're on the 207.174 net. 
on that case, we'll actually create a mask for those particular clients and say, okay, you clients, if you're coming in from that location, then we're actually going to translate your address. So this is how we can say, okay, based on what clients are coming in from what locations, we can decide how those clients are being, are being routed to our server. Note that the order in which the entries appear in the table is the order in which the rules are applied. So you'll need to make sure that these, these rules are applied in the correct order. So, wow, security. We've really only touched, barely, barely touched on the topic of secure, securing Citrix, but we've talked about what you need to know for the CCA exam. There's a lot more out there that is involved with ensuring that your Citrix architectures are set up properly and secured properly from external attack. We talked about the different possible architectures that you can use both with just Citrix, with Citrix and web interface, and then also adding in the secure gateway components. We talked about the ICA encryption capabilities and the SSL relay capabilities for smaller environments, and for larger environments or environments that are fronted to the internet, we talked about using web interface with the secure gateway. And we also talked about how to create those address translations so that certain clients can find your servers using certain types of addressing. I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.